it's really hot. You're making a YouTube video right now? Yeah. Does that surprise you? Yeah, I feel like you, you don't make those. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think I make these? <laughs> I don't know, I just feel like you don't make them that often. My meditation teacher training class has kind of sparked this little experiment about fear because as I've described, I kind of fell deep into a fear hole and I was scared to post anything and express anything. And I was going through all this stuff. Anyways, the meditation teacher training has this social media requirement as part of homework. This is also something I've touched on in the podcast already. And I've been using the class, the safe space of the class and the homework assignment as an excuse to kind of face my fears in this very little way, posting more freely on social media. Because when I was in that fear hole, I went back to only posting skateboarding and being scared I was gonna lose followers if I talked and posted about meditation and spirituality. Fear tends to be a self-imposed mental limitation. It's not, it's typically not real. Right, like it's a, it's a narrative that your mind comes up with. Like for my example, my mind comes up with a narrative about why I can only post about skateboarding or post about certain things on my Instagram because it's brand friendly, because my followers are gonna like it. I'm gonna get a lot of engagement. I'm gonna get a lot of validation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's this big mind narrative but let's say I wake up one day and I have something to say, something to post, and it doesn't line up with that narrative, that's that fear. That's that, that's that limitation that my mind imposes on myself that is not actually real. But when you break that first fear barrier, for example, I posted a photo of a banana on Instagram. I had to just do something extreme. It's funny I say extreme because that's not extreme at all. I'm just posting a picture of a banana. But internally it felt kind of extreme, right? So that's stepping through fear. When you step through fear and you see that nothing bad happened, it's easier to do it again. And I've noticed that I have a temptation to step through my fear once. For example, post a picture of a banana on Instagram and then I decide, okay, I did it. Like I'm good, I face my fear, now I can go back into my hole. That's my pattern. I face my fear once, and then I think I've made this big accomplishment, and then I go back into my hole. It's like if you think about a, a burrowing animal, like running out for a piece of food, grabbing it, and then running back into safety, that's kind of the way I've been interacting with life. But the thing is, if, if you buy it that the mind's narrative, what makes us fearful in so many situations is just not even real, it's just a mind pattern, why the temptation to run back? I, I think the thing is how you create an upward spiral is you run out of your burrow, you grab that piece of food or you face the fear, you do the thing that you're scared of, and then you stay out there, you keep your heart open, right? And you do it again and again and again, what if facing your fear became the thing that was habituated? That's what I'm thinking about. I have more to say, but let me show you my apartment while I drink my coffee. Okay, so this is the apartment when I fell back into samsara thinking that an external desire would fix all my problems. This is the apartment I thought would fix all my issues and bring me eternal happiness. It did not, but I still love it. And I'm, I'm, now that I'm having clarity, I'm seeing, I'm appreciating it more. Here's the kitchen. This is Julia. Hi. Can't forget this. Here's the Julia Palace. It's kind of dark, I need to bump my ISO. Okay, railroad style, narrow hallway, there's the bathroom. This is turning into like my little sanctuary. So this is where when MTT, meditation teacher training is online. I take it here. I have this cool poster that we found in the neighborhood. Um, this is also where I edit the podcast, do all sorts of work related things. Photo of Ramdas. Electric guitar. I've still been working on the guitar a little bit. Barn party poster. Acoustic guitar. This I think could kind of turn into a shrine of sorts. And this is typically where I meditate on this cushion. 
These are photos that a friend named Sun took during meditation teacher training. I will cherish these photos. Snake plant, if you've been following uh, my YouTube for a while, you might be familiar with this snake plant. This has been kicking it with me for a few years now. Here's the bedroom. A really cool part about this apartment is the sun comes in this side in the afternoon. Um, and in the morning it comes through in the kitchen. So that's pretty cool. And the middle rooms also have these shaftway windows. Um, check this out. This book is recommended, not required reading for our meditation teacher training and it's awesome. It's a meditation guide. It's, it's a very straightforward and practical meditation guide guiding you through the nine stages of meditation. Something really cool this class is giving me is more structure in my mind, more understanding of what meditation is. This book really highlights the importance of developing a single pointed focus on your object of meditation, such as the breath. So I've been really motivated to sit down in meditation, focus on my breath. We've been doing other kinds of meditations in the class as well, but focus on my breath and see how long I can just stay focused on the breath. And it's actually really fun. I'm really motivated. There's a lot of joyful effort. It's beautiful. <laughs> What's it been like for you since I started the meditation class? I think it's been great. <laughs> Why? Because you seem a lot calmer. <laughs> Medita really like learning about what you're learning about. Meditation increases tranquility. What's mm -hmm. the coolest thing that I've shared with you? Um, the love meditation. You like that? Yeah, that was my favorite one. Cool. Mm -hmm. I also just like that you can lead meditations for me now. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and I think you're good at it. Oh. You seem happier. <laughs> I'm happy you're making friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm making friends. Yeah, I might go on a tangent here. You don't have okay. to stay. Okay. Here's the thing about this sort of Buddhist path, like no longer can you say my problems come from not having the right job or not having enough money. You can't say that anymore. You can't, you cannot define the problem as being outside of you anymore. Bye. It's really fascinating, right? Like. I spent my whole, if what feels like most of my upbringing, at least from later high school and on, pretty much all of my energy was spent working hard so that I could have the outer circumstances that I thought would make me happy, right? The, the onus, the basis, the, the, the center was placed outside. But the, the fundamental understanding is that the world we see is the world that we are projecting in our own minds. Our teacher, Hector Marcel, loves to say this thing, that the world is not coming this way, the world is being projected or created this way. And the first time he said that, it, it didn't fully hit me, even though this is something that I feel like I used to have a knowing of. 
It didn't fully connect, but then as I attended more classes and started sinking my mind into these things and finally started meditating again, it hit me. It's like, it, it, what it comes down to is how are you seeing the world? And that ties into karma and emptiness that I tried to touch on in the last episode. That's, that's the crux of what we're learning is the power of meditation. If you acknowledge the fact that our minds create our reality, right? So as you scan whatever room you're in, your mind is, is projecting all these labels, it's projecting all these definitions of the way that things are, but that's not truly the way things are. That's your mind's projection of reality. So meditation is the work of training how we see that reality and we're training it for the better. We're training it to see more love and joy and bliss in things instead of suffering and frustration and annoyance and anger, right? So it's, it's fascinating to take that responsibility in, in all situations and it's difficult, it's really difficult. This is another fascinating thing that I'm learning in meditation teacher training. It's that my assumption of how other people are seeing me is typically way off the mark. For example, each time I sit down to teach a meditation for this training, I feel so incredibly nervous. I feel shaky. I feel like I don't know what I'm talking about. I feel like I'm stumbling through the meditation. And then at the end, I get all this positive feedback and everyone had all these amazing experiences. And it's like my assumption that I'm not doing a good job, my assumption that I don't know what I'm talking about, my assumption that I'm not being clear and coherent is so often incorrect. What that realization has been helping me do is it's been helping me step into my confidence more. It's been helping me drop the narrative, drop the fear, back to that fear topic. It's been helping me drop the narrative that I don't know what I'm talking about. Dropping that narrative enables me to show up from the beginning with more confidence, right? And I can apply this to creating this video too. I might have this idea that everyone's gonna be surprised and potentially annoyed that I'm uploading something that's not the podcast. When we have these narratives about how we think people are perceiving us, we have no idea. We have no idea at all. And, and I can flip this. When I experience someone else, I don't actually know who they are. I just have my own perception of that person and my perception is not gonna match their perception of themselves. And this should be a liberating perspective. And you can take this even further because nobody's right. Like nobody is ultimately right. Actually, all of these perspectives are right for each person. The perspective I have for myself is the perspective I have of myself. The perspective my partner has of me is the perspective she has of me. They're not gonna be the same. They're probably never gonna be the same. What this indicates is the fact that I'm empty of nature. I am nobody, therefore I can be anybody. The beautiful thing about emptiness is that paves the way for karma. If I plant the right karmic seeds, I'll begin to see a more and more and more beautiful version of myself. I wanna bring it back to my fear experiment, right? And this video is an embodiment of the fear experiment. What is actually happening here is when you, when you push past the frontier, that barrier in your mind of what you think you're allowed to do, what it, what's easy for you, what you think you're capable of, when you take the fear of going past that barrier and you just let the fear be there and you push past it anyway, what you're doing is the process of expanding who you are. You're literally expanding who you are. My teacher Hector would say you're gaining stretch marks. When I sit down to teach a meditation on Sundays in my class, I'm stretching into this identity of meditation teacher. And, and all that's required is breaking through the fear, doing the thing anyway, and being consistent with breaking through the fear, right? Don't run out of your burrow, grab the carrot, and then run back in. Instead, run out of your burrow, grab the carrot, and enjoy the sunshine, and look for another carrot. That's what I'll leave you with. Thank you for joining me in this experiment. I love you. I'll see you soon.